This is the 16th in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In this lecture, we want to re-examine the, the example of isometric immersions. We uh, considered this example quite a while ago, but now we've got a new variant of the cartan cater theorem, which allows some notion of non-characteristic initial data. And we've also got a notion of Cauchy characteristics, so we can look at how the system works out to, to be defined on a quotient manifold. So recall how uh, the isometric immersion system worked. We started off with a surface S in three-dimensional Euclidean space, and we wrote its Gauss curvature as K. The problem was to find isometric immersions of this surface, in other words, ways of deforming the surface so that it still remains uh, having the same lengths of all of its curves. Um, so we're going to look at all possible uh, local isometric immersions, isometric immersions of open sets of the surface. And those will be the integral manifolds of an exterior differential system, which we wrote down before. When we wrote down that system, we calculated its tableau, and it was our example, our only example so far, of finding torsion. We found that there was a torsion condition that uh, if us, we were going to isometrically immerse a surface with Gauss curvature k, then the shape operator of the isometric immersion had to turn out to have uh, Gauss curvature k as well. It had to have determinant k. So we wrote the frame bundles as uh, little corners uh, next to the surface and to Euclidean three-dimensional space. And we worked it out as a system initially on that uh, product of frame bundles. And then we had to put in somehow uh, additional variables to represent potential, pos uh, potential choices of shape operator. And, and then we had to impose a condition uh, on the shape operator matching up its determinant with the Gauss curvature. We'll write R3 sub A for the set of all symmetric matrices. So capital A is little a i j. Um, and we'll ins insist that those symmetric matrices will be used as potential um, choices of, of shape operator for our surface uh, when we immerse it. So we found that the exterior differential system initially had some torsion. But to get rid of that torsion, we had to impose exactly the condition that the curvature of the surface, cap, uh, this capital K, uh, has to match exactly the determinant of this quadratic form as potential choice of shape operator for the immersion of the surface. That's the Gauss equation. And we let this M prime naught, uh, recall the notation, it was a bit uh, complicated because we'd gone through various steps at this point in the, in the process. Uh, we found that uh, we had a manifold M prime naught on which we had an exterior differential system. And it consisted, M prime naught, of exactly those choices of a frame on the surface, a frame in Euclidean space, and uh, a potential uh, shape operator, a quadratic form A, uh, so that A has determinant K. And A was assumed to be non-zero, so that we didn't have any problems with, uh, with working out the, uh, the, the exterior differential system. There was a technical detail there to make sure that we had A non-zero to get the right, uh, the right uh, 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 characters. OK, so what we've uh, then done here was to write out our, we've written out our, our, our forms on the frame bundle of, this, of the surface. In the frame bundle of the surface, we had forms, uh, which soldering forms, which write as omega 1, omega 2. And we again write the, the form, the connection form, gamma 1, 2. We write it as alpha, just to make it a, a, a short form a notation. Um, then on the frame bundle of Euclidean space, we had uh, soldering forms, omega 1 prime, omega 2 prime, omega 3 prime. And again, we'll write alpha prime to mean gamma 1, 2 prime, just as a short form notation. And then we had gamma 2, 3 prime, gamma 3, 1 prime. Those uh, six differential forms form a basis for every cotangent space on the frame bundle of Euclidean space. So that's our, our notation for the frame bundle um, and notation for the forms in the frame bundle. And what we want to do now is to write down the system. It's convenient not to uh, use the, the differentials of the AIJs, the, the components of our potential shape operator. Um, as the one forms we use, but instead to use these expressions. Capital D AIJ just is defined to mean this expression here, uh, the exterior derivatives of the AIJs plus this various gamma A's minus A gammas. And the reason we use that notation is just because these expressions arise when we calculate out our tableau. So it's convenient to give them a name. Uh, we'll call them capital D AIJ. And of course, on any integral manifold, these will correspond to covariant derivatives. 
but we won't need to worry about that. We're not interested in actually taking covariant derivatives of the shape operator. We just find these expressions arising when we compute the tableau for the exterior differential system, and so we give them names. Now we want to write down what is that exterior differential system in terms of these forms. We've written down our invariantly defined forms on the on the manifold m naught prime, and we want to write down the exterior differential system on m naught prime. The exterior differential system had one forms in it, which were theta naught is alpha prime minus alpha, so the vanishing of that will force the connection forms to match, and that was something we found was forced on us by trying to uh, to make the soldering forms vanish. We differentiated and found it forced the connection forms to vanish. So we'll include that in the exterior differential system. And then in the exterior differential system, we also have to include that the, uh, the shape operator coefficients, these AIJs for a potential shape operator, have to match the actual shape operator of the immersed surface. And so we have to have this gamma I3 prime has to be equal to AIJ omega J so that it will force the shape operator of the immersion uh, to match the potential shape operator AIJ. Um, if you take the exterior derivatives of theta naught and the theta i's, you find exactly this uh, tableau: the first row being from theta naught, and the second two rows from the second and third rows from um, from the theta two, uh, theta two and theta um, theta one and theta two. Sorry, theta one and theta two. Um, so that's the the tableau of the system, and um, we can see which differential forms live in the tableau. We know that we've got theta naught, theta one, theta two, and uh, as one forms, and then as two forms, we've got these expressions which involve the differentials of the AIJs. Note that we've assumed in our uh, in in our setting up of our of our exterior differential system, we've assumed that the determinant of the matrix A is equal to the Gauss curvature. And that means that among those uh, forms that we're looking at here, these capital D AIJs, that there are actually only two of them uh, which are linear, linearly independent, because there's one linear relation among them, which is that, uh, that given by the, the fact that the determinant of the capital A matrix must be the Gauss curvature. OK, so there are the, the one forms, there are the two forms, there's the tableau. We know that it's involutive. Um, and we could ask ourselves, are there any Cauchy characteristics for this system? So uh, we don't really learn much from from looking at uh, cartan kaler theorem uh, by examining this system right away. We just see that, OK, it's involutive. And we already knew that. We've done that before. But the new idea is to look first for Cauchy characteristics. And if you look at all the differential forms that appear, you've got the thetas. You've got these omega 1, omega 2, and alphas as the various omegas in the system, and the various pi's, the, the, the polars. You've got these various differentials, uh, these capital D AIJs. Um, so uh, you've got actually only two polars, DA11 and DA12. And then DA22 is, of course, a multiple of those uh, because of the, as we said before, because the determinant of capital A is equal to the Gauss curvature. So that's the system. What's missing, we can ask. When we look for Cauchy characteristics, we look for missing differential forms, uh, forms that don't appear there. And we can say that, there, for example, there is no uh, alpha plus alpha prime appearing anywhere. There's alpha minus alpha prime, but there isn't uh, an alpha plus alpha prime. The reason I choose alpha plus alpha prime is that intuitively it, it's, it's really about matching up forms and one forms and the other. And so it's more symmetrical looking to choose alpha plus alpha prime as our choice of the differential form that's missing. Um, so we then can look for uh, a, some sort of dual object uh, that would represent a dual vector field to that in that co-framing. But we could do more. We could look for symmetries. What are some symmetries of the exterior differential system? We want to quotient not just by Cauchy characteristic vector fields, but also by some discrete symmetries. And we'll find, not just looking for discrete symmetries, looking for, for, for all the symmetries we can find, uh, one natural choice of them, a uh, collection of, of, of symmetries that are, that are uh, going to be very uh, helpful to look at here will be uh, that you could take your, your co-framing, uh, you could take your, your, your frame of uh, vector fields E1, 2, 3 on the surface, E1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime on the immersed image and the shape operator, and you could change uh, those frames. You could change the choice of E1, 2, 3 frame by changing E1 and E2 to be some orthogonal matrix H times these E1 and E2. So we could transform them orthogonally and uh, maybe put a sign in front of E3. And the same way, orthogonally transform E1, 
uh, prime and e2 prime, and I put the same sign in front of e3 prime. That will mean we, that we've we've rotated the tangent plane or reflected the tangent plane e1 e2, and possibly flipped the normal e3 to our surface, and done the same thing to its immersed image. And at the same time, of course, we then have to change the sign. If we change the sign of E3, we change the sign of E3 prime, we have to change the sign of the matrix A because um, it's going to appear in our, in our exterior differential system uh, at, with a lot paired along with, with E3. We know that if we change the sign of E3, we should change, or E3 prime, we should change the sign of A so that the shape operator remains well defined as a quadratic form, not valued in numbers, but valued in the normal bundle to the to the surface so and then those normal lines okay so that will be a change of frames that will work and it includes not only the the, the rotations of this h being a rotation of the tangent plane but also reflections of the tangent plane if you think about just the rotations you let that little h matrix be a rotation matrix it'll rotate the tangent plane of s it'll also rotate exactly correspondingly the rotation uh will occur on the on the on the immersed image, the tangent plane of the immersed image of, 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 of the surface. So um, this really represents the Cauchy characteristic because it's acting by, uh, by a, a motion that gives you something in alpha and something in alpha prime. And it'll, uh, so it'll be the, the Cauchy characteristic vector field. Um, will, it will have flow given by that rotation. Okay, so that, that gives rise to that Cauchy characteristic. But there's still also the possibility of using a reflection matrix for H and also the possibility of having a plus or minus sign. And we want to include all of those. We want to include all of those symmetries of the exterior differential system as being part of the, of the, um, the, the, the uh, group of transformations that we'll reduce by, we'll quotient by, to make a quotient manifold M bar. So what is the quotient manifold? If you quotient out by all of these possibilities, we're allowing ourselves to arbitrarily rotate and reflect the tangent plane to our surface and the corresponding tangent plane to its immersed image uh, and, to and to reflect the normal line to the surface and reflect the corresponding normal line to the immersed image. And so those will still match up perfectly by linear isometries. We're also allowing ourselves to change the sign of the shape operator, but that means that it will be of the shape operator matrix A, but that means that the operator, when you think of it as valued in the normal line, will still be well defined. And so what is the quotient space? It's a choice of something. Well, you get to choose a point X and a corresponding point X prime, still, though that hasn't changed because that isn't altered by this, by this action here. But you, uh, once you've chosen that data, you also get to choose an isometric linear map from the tangent plane to the surface. So this is E1, E2 maps to E1 prime, E2 prime. And that's an isometric linear map to some plane P in R3. Um, and uh, we think of it as in the tangent space at the point X prime. And then um, uh, that uh, when, you, when you replace E1, E2 by this this rotation by this matrix H in any one E prime E2 prime by the same rotation by the matrix H, you still get the same isometric linear map. So that isometric linear map is still well defined, but also we have this A, which is going to give us a quadratic form on the tangent plane to the surface, which is valued in that normal line to that plane. So that's all uh, uh, well-defined data, and if you think about it, that's all there is, that the quotient space consists of exactly that. So leave you to check that, that that's exactly the quotient space, but it's a very geometric object. So again, the idea is that the original space M we were we dealt with, or in this case it was called M naught prime, is somehow very algebraic. We have these these explicit expressions for these differential forms living on it. M bar, the quotient space, is somehow more geometric. We have a more geometric description of it, but we don't have any explicit differential forms written on it. It's not so easy to write out what's defined on M bar. It's more easy. It's much more easy to work with the algebra up on M and to think of the geometry down on M bar. So um, we still have an involutive exterior differential system up on M, and of course it drops to an involutive exterior differential system on M bar. Um, and so we get the same uh, uh, characters, and we can just um, uh, invoke the cartan kähler theorem uh, without having to redo the work down on M bar. Um, now, what 
kind of non-characteristic initial data do we get to pick? That's the really interesting issue here because we've got this, this slightly stronger variant of the Cartan-Kaler theorem now that enables us to pick some kind of global initial data. Recall that on a surface S, an asymptotic curve is a curve on which the shape operator vanishes on the tangent lines to the curve. So um, now we're not interested in asymptotic curves on S. We're interested in asymptotic curves on its immersed image. We want to somehow build an, immerse, an immersion in such a way that we make sure that, that we're building it as we move along building it. We're not, uh, we're not moving along an asymptotic curve in the immersed image. So we want to sort of avoid to avoid somehow a, a constructing a long and asymptotic curve because that's going to turn out to be um, our, our characteristics. So I leave you to check in um, by looking at the the exterior differential system, looking at the tableau, that the characteristics of this quotient system, which of course correspond to the characteristic up uh, characteristics up on the system upstairs on M, uh, are um, are going to correspond to asymptotic curves. If you had a an integral manifold of that exterior differential system it would correspond to a surface uh, which would then be an actual immersion of our original surface S into three-dimensional Euclidean space and the characteristic curves on that uh, that integral surface of that exterior differential system would correspond exactly to the asymptotic curves on the immersed image. Um, so I won't do that I'll let you check that and again it's all done in detail I think in the, in the lecture notes. So suppose we took a curve drawn on the surface S. Um, then we'll isometrically immerse that curve in an arbitrary manner into three-dimensional Euclidean space. But that's not enough initial data to determine our isometric immersion. We'll also pick a ribbon, which is a plane, P, capital P. That'll be the plane we've already been thinking about previously. It'll be a capital uh, P plane, P of S, tangent to that immersion at each point. So that's supposed to be the collection of possible tangent planes, of potential tangent planes for our immersed surface. We want to immerse our surface S and make it be tangent to this, uh, along the curve, uh, the image of the curve C, we want it to be tangent to these, uh, to these planes of this ribbon. So a ribbon consists of an immersed curve, um, so this immersion of, of, of our curve C, together with a, uh, with a plane, which is tangent to that immersion at each point, and we're going to try and make our surface be tangent to that ribbon along that curve. Now we have to be a bit careful. There is a condition to avoid asymptotic curves, and this condition, I'll leave you to, to, to check the details. Um, we have to make sure that if, if we constructed a, uh, an immersion of the surface uh, along, that, uh, along the tangent to that ribbon, um, the problem is that if we run into, run into asymptotics, uh, into an asymptotic curve, uh, just where we had some problem where the curvature vector of the curve C turned out to be uh, to be perpendicular to the ruling line of of the ribbon. Um, so the ruling line of the ribbon means the per perpendicular curve to C. Um, what we want to make sure is the ruling line of the ribbon should be nowhere perpendicular to the curvature vector of C. I'll let you check that if you did have an uh, an immersed uh, surface, an immersion of S along the ribbon a tangent to the ribbon, then the asymptotic curves would appear uh, tangent to the ribbon, uh, tangent to the tangent to to C exactly where this this condition fails. So um, so this is a geometric condition that enables us to to ensure that as we lay out the surface S along the ribbon, tangent to the ribbon, we never have asymptotic curves. We never have any uh, tangent to, to C. So uh, so this is this is the condition we need to make sure that 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 we can avoid characteristics in the exterior differential system. But if you did have such an immersion of the surface along tangent to that ribbon, then um, you can check that under this condition, you could actually compute out the shape operator. The shape operator has three, uh, has, has three components, but subject to one condition that, that its determinant should be the Gauss curvature. So there are really only two components, and those two happen to be the curvature vector components. It has essentially two components because you know it has, has to be normal to, to the curve C, so it has to lie in that normal space, which is two-dimensional. So it's not surprising that there is exactly the right count, and under this uh, non-degeneracy condition here, then you can really solve for the, the, sh the shape operator and you end up with with no problems about asymptotics. 
you can find a, that the shape rider is uniquely determined and does not have uh, C as an asymptotic, or as an asymptotic curve. Okay, so so you can find um, the shape operator from the curvature vector, and it makes C not asymptotic. Um, if there was such an such an immersion, it would make sure that C would not be asymptotic. But then you can turn that around and check that the system you've got actually works out to be um, a suitable initial data, non-characteristic initial data for um, for the cartan kähler theorem. And by the cartan kähler theorem, and again, this this requires there's a bit of detail to work out here, um, leaving a lot of steps for you to check. But um, by by the cartan kähler theorem, you get a locally unique isometric immersion extending this isometric immersion of the curve. So you can think of this in the following way. Imagine you have an orange and you have a knife and you want to peel that orange. Imagine you have a ribbon in space, a long thin ribbon um, floating in space. You can somehow, even if the ribbon is 100 miles long and the orange is very small, uh, you can somehow uh, peel the orange and arrange the orange peel tangent to the ribbon all the way along and make sure that um, that it produces an isometric immersion of the orange of the, the sphere, which is the, the, the skin of the orange, all the way along that ribbon going for that 100 miles. So that's the, the, the intuitive notion we have here for how we construct an isometric immersion. OK, so putting that together, um, what we get is is we, we get to, to pick global initial data. We get to pick the ribbon, and it could be a million miles long. We only get a local solution in that it's only existing in some little uh, width across the uh, across the, the the across the curve C. The, so we isometrically merge this curve C, which could be miles long. But once we've done that, we only get a little tiny thickening of C into a, into an immersion of surface and, and uh, to an immersed surface, which is uh, which, which is an immersion of some open set of the surface S. So uh, so we only get a local solution. We don't get global solvability, but we do get that uh, a, a clear notion of how much initial data we get to pick is a geometric description of the initial data, and it enables us to pick that data in a more global manner. So putting it all together, roughly speaking, the quotient uh, spaces m bar are usually somehow more geometric and m more algebraic. We can work on m with explicit computations in many examples, but m bar is what we really care about because it's where, where the geometry lives, where we want, where we want the answers to, to, to be interpreted. Um, we compute on m, but we understand what the computation means on m bar. And uh, this enables us to get some kind of geo geometric picture arising out of some algebraic computations in differential forms on some sort of bundles. And that, I think, explains to some extent why, right from the beginning, we've been working with frame bundles rather than working in coordinates. We get to use global initial data in this space M bar. And some local solution in M actually drops down to a solution in M bar. It's still only local. It's a small thickening of our global initial data submanifold. But nevertheless, it's defined all the way along that initial data submanifold. So you get global initial data, local solutions. You work on M. You understand what it means on M bar. Next time, we'll work out the example of conformal maps, which is one we've also done before. So we can get a sense of how this sort of theory works in yet another example on surface theory where we can uh, get some sense of the uh, what sort of initial data we get to pick.